So I wanted to make a video analyzing one of my favorite stories by Anton Chekhov. It's called Volodya. And I struggled to think how I could do so in a compelling way without somebody who was watching the analysis having read the story themselves. So I thought of something a bit different. I thought maybe we can read the story together and analyze it together in real time. Hey, I don't know if it's gonna work, but I think it might. So. Let's grab it. Let's grab Anton Chekhov and I am reading from the Constance Garnet edition. Let's listen and what I want to do is try and in the process of reading is get to the heart of the truth of Chekhov because that's the thing about Chekhov. He offers up slices of life in a truthful manner and I don't know how exactly we can verbalize what he's doing without having seen what he's doing. So let's try. Volodya by Anton Chekhov. At five o'clock one Sunday afternoon in summer, Volodya, a plain, shy, sickly-looking lad of 17, was sitting in the arbour of the Shumian's country villa, feeling dreary. His despondent thoughts flowed in three directions. In the first place, he had next day, Monday, an examination in mathematics. He knew that if he did not get through the written examination on the morrow, he would be expelled for he had already been two years in the sixth form and had two and three quarter marks for algebra in his annual report. In the second place, his presence at the villa of the Shumians, a wealthy family with aristocratic pretensions, was a continual source of mortification to his armour proper. It seemed to him that Madame Shumian looked upon him and his maman as poor relations and dependents, that they laughed at his maman and did not respect her. He had on one occasion accidentally overheard Madame Shumian in the veranda telling her cousin Anna Fyodorovna that his maman still tried to look young and got herself up, that she never paid her losses at cards and had a partiality for other people's shoes and tobacco. Every day Volodya besought his maman not to go to the Shumians and drew a picture of the humiliating part she played with these gentlefolk. He tried to persuade her, said rude things, but she a frivolous, pampered woman who had run through two fortunes, her own and her husband's, in her time, and always gravitated towards acquaintances of high rank, did not understand him. And twice a week, Volodya had to accompany her to the villa he hated. In the third place, the youth could not for one instance get rid of a strange, unpleasant feeling which was absolutely new to him. It seemed to him that he was in love with Anna Fyodorovna, the Shumian's cousin, who was staying with them. She was a vivacious, loud-voiced, laughter-loving, healthy and vigorous lady of thirty, with rosy cheeks, plump shoulders, a plump round chin, and a continual smile on her lips. She was neither young nor beautiful. Volodya knew that perfectly well, but for some reason he could not help thinking of her, looking at her while she shrugged her plump shoulders and moved her flat back as she played croquet, or after prolonged laughter and running up and down the stairs, sank into a low chair and, half closing her eyes and gasping for breath, pretended that she was stifling and could not breathe. She was married. Her husband, a staid and dignified architect, came once a week to the villa, slept soundly and returned to town. Volodya's strange feeling had begun with his conceiving an unaccountable hatred for the architect and feeling relieved every time he went back to town. I just want to point out, I love how he describes this, uh, this lady, this 30-year-old, who, uh, you know, is a bit too old for him, and she's not, she's not classically beautiful, or typically beautiful, and he's obviously in adolescence, he's on the cusp of kind of realising his sexuality and all that sort of thing, and he's very awkward, it's an awkward phase of life, but I love how he describes her, and then in just one sentence, right in the middle of the description, she was married. Those three words, amazing, and then goes on, it's like it derails the whole thing. Anyway, back to the story. Now sitting in the arbour, thinking of his examination the next day, and of his maman, at whom they laughed, he felt an intense desire to see Nyuta, that was what the Shumians called Anna Fyodorovna, to hear her laughter and the rustle of her dress. This desire was not like the pure poetic love of which he read in novels and about which he dreamed every night when he went to bed. It was strange, incomprehensible. He was ashamed of it and afraid of it as of something very wrong and impure something which it was disagreeable to confess, even to himself. Yeah, so what's going on here? He's, he's, he's ashamed, he knows, or he feels that he knows that there is a pure love, a poetic love. He's read about it in novels, and, but that's unaccessible to him. It's like this sense of guilt in coming into one's sexuality and not feeling that yours is pure, yours is correct, in feeling self-hatred and not 
not feeling as though you are doing the right thing. And he kind of externalizes, like all he knows about women is from his mum, who's embarrassing him, as every teenage mother's, uh, every teenage son's mother usually does. And then he knows this one person who, again, is not typically beautiful, but he, he seems to have some weird um, attraction to her that's mingled in with his mother. So there's some Oedipus complex shit going on here, I think. Anyway, it's not love, he said to himself. One can't fall in love with women of 30 who are married. It's only a little intrigue. Yes, an intrigue. Pondering on the intrigue, he thought of his uncontrollable shyness, his lack of moustache, his freckles, his narrow eyes, and put himself in his imagination side by side with Nuta, and the juxtaposition seemed to him impossible. Then he made haste to imagine himself bold, handsome, witty, dressed in the latest fashion. When his dreams were at their height, as he sat huddled together and looking at the ground in a dark corner of the arbour, he heard the sound of light footsteps. Someone was coming slowly along the avenue. Soon the steps stopped, and something white gleamed in the entrance. Is anyone here? asked a woman's voice. Volodya recognised the voice, and raised his head in a fright. Who is here? asked Nuta, going into the arbour. Ah, it is you, Volodya. What are you doing here? Thinking? And how can you go on thinking, thinking, thinking? That's the way to go out of your mind. Volodya got up, and looked in a dazed way at Nuta. She had only just come back from bathing. Over her shoulder there was hanging a sheet and a rough towel, and from under the white silk kerchief on her head he could see the wet hair sticking to her forehead. There was the cool, damp smell of the bathhouse, and of almond soap still hanging about her. She was out of breath from running quickly. The top button of her blouse was undone so that the boy saw her throat and bosom. And what, what's cool about this, and what's very truthful, is... He takes a smell, well he takes little things that he's noticed, like hair sticking to her forehead. Um, but he doesn't say anything, he doesn't say how that might make him feel, he just says it. And by virtue of selecting it, that tells us everything we need to know. And he talks about the smell of the bathhouse. And so you've got this one person representing a whole panoply of images. Immediately he's probably thinking about her in the bathhouse, her naked. And as if to drive that home, Chekhov then says the top button of her blouse was undone. Matter of fact, just factual statement. So the boy saw her throat and bosom. So immediately we're thinking of him, Vlodja, we see, like in a cinematic way, um, if you wanted to film this, we see her top button, and then we see his eyes, and then we see her, her throat, from his point of view, then her bosom. It's, it's so adolescently awkward. Okay. Why don't you say anything? said Nuta, looking Vlodja up and down. It's not polite to be silent when a lady talks to you. What a clumsy seal you are, though, Vlodja. You always sit, saying nothing, thinking like some philosopher. There's not a spark of life or fire in you. You are really horrid. At your age, you ought to be living, skipping and jumping, chattering, flirting, falling in love. I love that. I, lo I love that. It feels like somebody's actually said this. Like somebody could say that. That's why it's so truthful. And I just like the ordering, the progression, the lists. I love lists in literature. You should be living, skipping and jumping, chattering, flirting, falling in love. It gets this, it's a progression, isn't it? And you can kind of see it all, and it's a progression, chatting. And then chatting becomes flirting. It's a very specific type of chatting. And then flirting becomes falling in love. And this expectation, she's, she's, she's toying with him. As you'll see in the story goes on, she's just mucking about with him, she, which is really unfair. She says, you're horrid. But she's, either she doesn't realise what saying that to somebody who kind of idealises her, or somebody at that awkward age, uh, he doesn't, she doesn't realise how affecting that is. And I think sometimes we don't when we talk to young people. We either think they're older than they are or we think that they're younger than they are and they, they're not going to get affected by the things we say. But saying that to someone so impressionable isn't nice. And that's, that's a defining thing. And he's, he'll start to resent her. That love will turn into resentment. And uh, it's a resentment not only of her, but of women generally, his mother, and resentment of himself. Hmm. Um, it stands out. And anybody who's been in that awkward adolescent phase and had someone older say something critical or negative of you can, can really relate to that. Like, Chekhov just summons the pain without saying it's painful. It just puts you there in Volodya's body. It makes it painful for you. Anyway, Volodya looked at the sheet that was held by a plump white hand and thought... The thought... He doesn't... We don't even know his thoughts. Yuta just cuts him off. He's mute, said Nuta, with wonder. It's strange, really. Listen, be a man. Come, you might smile at least. 
Phew, the horrid philosopher, she laughed. But do you know, Vologia, why you are such a clumsy seal? Because you don't devote yourself to the ladies. Why don't you? It's true there are no girls here, but there is nothing to prevent your flirting with the married ladies. Why don't you flirt with me, for instance? Vologia listened and scratched his forehead in acute and painful irresolution. It's only very proud people who are silent and love solitude, Muta went on, pulling his hand away from his forehead. You are proud, Vologia. Why do you look at me like that from under your brows? Look at me straight in the face, if you please. Yes, now then, clumsy seal. Vologia made up his mind to speak. Wanting to smile, he twitched his lower lip, blinked, and again put his hand to his forehead. I... I love you, he said. Nusa raised her eyebrows in surprise and laughed. What do I hear? She sang, as prima donnas sing at the opera when they hear something awful. What? What did you say? Say again, say again. I... I love you, repeated Vologia. And without his wills having any part in his action, without reflection or understanding, he took half a step towards Nuta and clutched her by the arm. Everything was dark before his eyes, and tears came into them. The whole world was turned into one big rough towel which smelt of the bathhouse. I love that. I love that. Um, so you've got trauma. He's traumatised. He's, he's crying. He said something silly. He said something awkward. He said something that he thinks he should say. Like he's, he's thinking about her. And then she gives him the go-ahead. She's like, flirt with me. And then he takes it way too far. And not only that, there's the idea of flirting and falling in love. It's, it's pithy. She's only saying, oh, not really. Like, just be a bit of a cad. A bit of a Don Juan, you know? Don Giovanni. A bit of a Casanova. And he's, he actually thinks, he's mistaken. He thinks that he loves her. Because he doesn't understand how he's feeling. Uh, this intrigue. He doesn't, he doesn't know how to translate it. So he's said that. And he somewhat means it, but he doesn't really know. And he's kind of confused. And she is just going to rinse him for it and oh oh it makes you cringe it makes you hurt and then i love this line the whole world was turned into one big rough towel which smelt of the bathhouse i can imagine him the whole world does that mean he's just now he's just looking at that towel and that's all he sees you can see like blurred vision and it's just towel and the smell and he's just overcome with it and this feeling of overwhelm is so succinctly and beautifully uh connoted suggested here, and that's why Chekhov's a genius. This line right here. Bravo! Bravo! He heard a merry laugh. Why don't you speak? I want you to speak. Well? Seeing that he was not prevented from holding her arm, Volodya glanced at Newton's laughing face and clumsily, awkwardly put both arms around her waist, his hands meeting behind her back. He held her around the waist with both arms while putting her hands up to her head, showing the dimples in her elbows. She set her hair straight under the kerchief and said in a calm voice, You must be tactful, polite, charming, and you can only become that under feminine influence. But what a wicked, angry face you have. You must talk, laugh. Yes, Vologia, don't be surly. You are young and will have plenty of time for philosophising. Come, let go of me. I am going. Let go. Without effort, she released her waist and, humming something, walked out of the arbour. Vologia was left alone. He smoothed his hair smiled and walked three times to and fro across the arbour. Then he sat down on the bench and smiled again. He felt insufferably ashamed, so much so that he wondered that human shame could reach such a pitch of acuteness and intensity. Shame made him smile, gesticulate, and whisper some disconnected words. That is the essence of this story. I think with Chekhov, he always takes some core... This is why he's so truthful, for why he's such, such a, a human is he takes something so fierce and makes it true and captures it and lets you feel it. And right now you're feeling shame. And I've got to say, shame along with guilt is one of the most powerful negative human, human emotions. It, it dictates almost everything that we do societally. It dictates how we feel about ourselves and the world. And if you shame people in order to get what you want, oh... It's a bad thing to do. And shame, what is shame? Let's talk about, for example, Newta. Her hubris is she's trying to make herself better than somebody else, than Volodya. So she thinks that she can build herself up by tearing somebody else down. So she's tearing down Volodya. That's not good, that's arrogance. And it's inducing shame in another person. That's no way to go through life. That's not nice. Um, anyway, let's go on. He was ashamed that he had been treated like a small boy, ashamed of his shyness, and most of all that he had had the audacity to put his arms round the waist of a respectable married woman, though, as it seemed to him, 
He had neither through age, nor by external quality, nor by social position, any right to do so. He jumped up, went out of the arbour, and without looking round, walked into the recesses of the garden furthest from the house. Ah, <sighs> only to get away from here as soon as possible, he thought, clutching his head. My God, as soon as possible. The train by which Volodya was to go back with his maman was at 8.40. There were three hours before the train started, but he would with pleasure have gone to the station at once without waiting for his maman. At eight o'clock he went to the house. His whole figure was expressive of determination. What would be, would be. He made up his mind to go in boldly, to look them straight in the face, to speak in a loud voice, regardless of everything. He crossed the terrace, the big hall and the drawing room, and there stopped to take breath. He could hear them in the dining room, drinking tea. Madame Shumian, Maman, and Nuta were talking and laughing about something. Volodya listened. I assure you, said Nuta, I could not believe my eyes when he began declaring his passion and, just imagine, put his arms around my waist. I should not have recognised him. And you know, he has a way with him. When he told me he was in love with me, there was something brutal in his face, like a cacassin. Really, gasped Maman, going off into a peal of laughter. Really? How he does remind me of his father. Volodya ran back and dashed out into the open air. How could they talk of it out loud? He wondered in agony, clasping his hands and looking up to the sky in horror. They talk aloud in cold blood. And Maman laughed. Maman! My God, why didst thou give me such a mother? Why? He's feeling betrayed. So not only do we have um, shame, but everybody knows that sense of betrayal, those closest to you. I mean, not everybody's overheard somebody talking about behind the back, but uh, probably a lot of people have. I know I have. It's very, very hurtful. Sometimes when you do something silly or miscalibrated or you misjudge something and you're ashamed of it and you're shy and you're embarrassed, you just hope that the person has it in their heart not to hurt you even further by keeping it um, respectably private. And sometimes people don't do that. Sometimes people will want to, again, tear you down and so build themselves up. And these are nasty people. Uh, people who talk behind your back. If you're talking to somebody and they're talking about somebody else to you, you know that they're going to talk about you when your back is turned. And it's nasty. And that feeling of betrayal that your own mother laughing at you and comparing you to a father who's no longer there. Uh, we can see he's got probably, he's got some mummy issues, but he's got some daddy issues as well. He's got the absent father. Hmm. Strong stuff. Chekhov is a, is a genius. Anyway. But he had to go to the house, come what might. He walked three times up and down the avenue, grew a little calmer, and went into the house. Why didn't you come in time for tea? Madame Shumin asked sternly. I'm sorry, it's, it's time for me to go, he muttered, not raising his eyes. Maman, it's eight o'clock. You go alone, my dear, said his maman languidly. I'm staying the night with Lily. Goodbye, my dear. Let me make the sign of the cross over you. She made the sign of the cross over her son and said in French, turning to Newta, He's rather like Lermontov, isn't he? Saying goodbye after a fashion, without looking anyone in the face, Volodya went out of the dining room. Ten minutes later, he was walking along the road to the station and was glad of it. Now he felt neither frightened nor ashamed. He breathed freely and easily. What's, what's interesting is, at the beginning, he says that they laugh about his mum behind her back. And now she's doing the same with those that laugh about her behind her back. She's laughing about him. And she's just appealing to them. And that makes you not trust people, not trust people's nature. And then she says, no, I'm not coming with you. And you start to think, oh, I've really done something wrong here. And you have to leave. Ah, oh, I just check off, man. You get me. <clears throat> about half a mile from the station, he sat down on a stone by the side of the road and gazed at the sun, which was half hidden behind a barrow. There were lights already here and there at the station, and one green light glimmered dimly, but the train was not yet in sight. It was pleasant to Volodya to sit still without moving and to watch the evening come in little by little. The darkness of the arbour, the footsteps, the smell of the bathhouse, the laughter and the waste, all these rose with amazing vividness before his imagination, and all this was no longer so terrible and important as before. It's of no consequence. She did not pull her hand away and laughed when I held her by the waist, he thought. So she must have liked it. If she had disliked it, she would have been angry. And now Volodya felt sorry that he had not more boldness there in the arbour. He felt sorry that he was so stupidly going away. And he was by now persuaded that if the same thing happened again, he would be bolder and look at it more simply. And it would not be difficult for the opportunity to occur again. They used to stroll about for a long time after supper at the Shumians. If Volodya went for a walk with Nuta in the dark garden, there would be an opportunity. I'll go back, he thought, and we'll go by the morning train tomorrow. I'll say I missed the train. And he turned back, 
Madame Shemian, my man, Yuta, and one of the nieces were sitting on the veranda, playing Vint. When Volodya told them the lie that he had missed the train, they were uneasy that he might be late for the examination next day, and advised him to get up early. All the while they were playing, he sat on one side, greedily watching Yuta and waiting. He already had a plan prepared in his mind. He would go up to Nyuta in the dark, would take her by the hand, then would embrace her. There would be no need to say anything, as both of them would understand without words. But after supper, the ladies did not go for a walk in the garden, but went on playing cards. They played till one o'clock at night, and then broke up to go to bed. How stupid it all is, Volodya thought with vexation as he got into bed. But never mind, I'll wait till tomorrow. Tomorrow in the arbor. It doesn't matter. He did not attempt to go to sleep, but sat in bed, hugging his knees and thinking. All thought of the examination was hateful to him. He had already made up his mind that they would expel him, and that there was nothing terrible about his being expelled. On the contrary, it was a good thing. A very good thing, in fact. Next day he would be as free as a bird. He would put on ordinary clothes instead of his school uniform, would smoke openly, come out here and make love to Nuta when he liked. And he would not be a schoolboy, but a young man. And as for the rest of it, what was called a career, a future, that was clear. Volodya would go into the army, or the telegraph service, or he would go into a chemist's shop and work his way up till he was a dispenser. There were lots of callings. An hour or two passed and he was still sitting and thinking. So he's going to throw away his whole life for this, this moment, this encapsulated moment. And the story is about the folly of youth, but it's also about shame and embarrassment and what happens when we find ourselves in a hole and he's found himself in a bit of a hole because he's been embarrassed and that's the thing when you're in a hole you need to stop digging but Volodya is going to keep digging he's throwing everything away and then they, he didn't even get a chance he, they kept playing cards it wasn't important enough to them his plan was scuppered so all right I'll do it tomorrow and I'll throw away my whole future so I can do it so I can <laughs> make love to this lady who hates me it's ridiculous Absolutely ridiculous. Um, stop digging. You're in a hole. Stop digging. Towards three o'clock, when it was beginning to get light, the door creaked cautiously, and his maman came into the room. Aren't you asleep? She asked, yawning. Go to sleep. I've only come in for a minute. I'm only fetching the drops. What for? Poor Lily has got spasms again. Go to sleep, my child. Your examination's tomorrow. She took a bottle of something out of the cupboard, went to the window, read the label, and went away. Maria Leontievna. Those are not drops. Volodya heard a woman's voice a minute later. That's Convalaria, and Lily wants morphine. Is your son asleep? Ask him to look for it. It was Nuta's voice. Volodya turned cold. He hurriedly put on his trousers, flung his coat over his shoulders, and went to the door. Do you understand? Morphine, Nuta explained in a whisper. There must be a label in Latin. Wake Volodya, he'll find it. The man opened the door, and Volodya caught sight of Nuta. She was wearing the same loose wrapper in which she had gone to bathe. Her hair hung loose and disordered on her shoulders. Her face looked sleepy and dark in the half-light. Why, Volodya is not asleep, she said. Volodya, look in the cupboard for the morphine. There's a dear. What a nuisance Lily is. She always has something the matter. My man muttered something, yawned and went away. Look for it, Nuta said. Why are you standing still? Volodya went to the cupboard, knelt down and began to look through the bottles and boxes of medicine. His hands were trembling and he had a feeling in his chest and stomach as though cold waves were running all over his inside. He felt suffocated and giddy from the smell of ether, carbolic acid, and various drugs, which he quite unnecessarily snatched up with his trembling fingers and spilled in doing so. I believe my man has gone, he thought. That's a good thing. A good thing. Will you be quick? said Nuta, drawling. In a minute. Here, I believe this is morphine, said Volodya, reading one of the labels, the word morph. Here it is. Nuta was standing in the doorway in such a way that one foot was in his room and one was in the passage. She was tidying her hair, which was difficult to put in order because it was so thick and long, and looked absent-mindedly at Volodya. In her loose wrap, with her sleepy face and her hair down, in the dim light that came into the white sky not yet lit by the sun, she seemed to Volodya captivating, magnificent. Fascinated, trembling all over, and remembering with relish how he had held that exquisite body in his arms in the arbour, he handed her the bottle and said, How wonderful you are. What? She came into the room. What? she asked, smiling. He was silent and looked at her. Then, just as in the arbour, he took her hand and she looked at him with a smile and waited for what would happen next. I love you, he whispered. She left off smiling, 
thought for a minute and said, Wait a little, I think somebody's coming. Oh, these schoolboys, she said in an undertone, going to the door and peeping out into the passage. No, there is no one to be seen. She came back. Then it seemed to Volodya that the room in Utah, the sunrise and himself, all melted together in one sensation of acute, extraordinary, incredible bliss, for which one might give up one's whole life and face eternal torments. But half a minute passed and all that vanished. Volodya saw only a fat, plain face, distorted by an expression of repulsion, and he himself suddenly felt a loathing for what had happened. So, that's it. He's, I mean, this is also why Chekhov's so good and why he just gets to the heart of human nature. We're all telling ourselves stories, aren't we? We tell ourselves, okay, this, this lady, she's not traditionally beautiful, she's not even nice, but I love her, it's not an intrigue, I love her. And you tell yourself that story, and then in the moment you have illusions shattered, and so many times people have fallen from grace in our eyes, and we have idealised idealized images of people shattered, ripped out from underneath us. And like shame, like feelings of betrayal, this feeling of shattered idealization is jarring and world-changing. And he realizes, it's early morning. I've thrown my whole life away because the examination's going down the shitter now. For what? For this lady who doesn't like me, who's scorning me? Whew. Chekhov. Right, back to Chekhov. I must go away, though, said Nuta, looking at Volodya with disgust. What a wretched, ugly, the ugly duckling. How unseemly her long hair, her loose wrap, her steps, her voice seemed to Volodya now. Ugly duckling, he thought, after she had gone away. I really am ugly. Everything is ugly. The sun was rising, the birds were singing loudly. He could hear the gardener walking in the garden and the creaking of his wheelbarrow. And soon afterwards he heard the lowing of the cows and the sounds of the shepherd's pipe. The sunlight and the sounds told him that somewhere in this world there is a pure, refined, poetical life. But where was it? Volodya had never heard a word of it from his mamam or any of the people around about him. That's another thing I love. I love this passage because it really captures that sense of maybe you're a bit sleep deprived and it's early morning and you hear these sounds, these early morning sounds, and you just associate them with purity. The tinkling of cowbells over a field, the lighting of a pipe. How silent, how, 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 how silent it must be to hear that through the, through the dawn and know that there is something more noble and you don't have access to it. And that's growing pains. That's growing pains, uh, something you can't reach. But here's the thing, if you're going through growing pains right now, keep going and persevere. Because if you give up now, you'll never get it. And that's, Chekhov is a master at capturing the pain and suffering of growing in adolescence. When the footman came to wake him, for the morning train, he pretended to be asleep. Bother it, damn it all, he thought. He got up between ten and eleven, combing his hair before the looking glass and looking at his ugly face, pale from his sleepless night, he thought, it's perfectly true, an ugly duckling. When Maman saw him and was horrified that he was not at his examination, Volodya said, I overslept myself, Maman, but don't worry, I will get a medical certificate. Madame Shumin and Newter waked up at one o'clock. Volodya heard Madame Shumin open her window with a bang, heard Nuta go off into a peal of laughter in reply to her coarse voice. He saw the door open and a string of nieces and other toadies, among the latter was his maman, file into lunch, caught a glimpse of Nuta's freshly washed laughing face, and beside her, the black brows and beard of her husband the architect who had just arrived. Nuta was wearing a little Russian dress which did not suit her at all, and made her look clumsy. The architect was making dull and vulgar jokes. The rissoles served at lunch had too much onion in them, so it seemed to Volodya. It also seemed to him that Newta laughed loudly on purpose, and kept glancing in his direction to give him to understand that the memory of the night did not trouble her in the least, and that she was not aware of the presence at table of the ugly duckling. At four o'clock, Volodya drove to the station with his maman. Foul memories, the sleepless night, the prospect of expulsion from school, the stings of conscience, all roused in him now an oppressive, gloomy anger. He looked at Maman's sharp profile, at her little nose, and at the raincoat which was a present from Nuta, and muttered, Why do you powder? It's not becoming at your age. You make yourself up, don't pay your debts at cards, smoke other people's tobacco, it's hateful. I don't love you. I don't love you. He just wants to be accepted by Nuta. 
And I think he sees a motherly aspect in her, and Newt's rejection of him is like his mother's rejection, and he reminds, he's reminded of that. And so her words about Maman are now in his mouth. And he's now, when he said, I love you, and he reached out to her, what he's really saying is he, he wants the love of his mother, which is obviously being rejected. And he tried to impose that on another woman, and she rejected him. And now he's retorting to that woman who symbolizes his mother, but to his mother, I don't love you. I don't love you. And so the mother's getting the fallout from him being rejected by his first love or whatever. But in a roundabout way, she is the start of it all. Freud would have a field day with this one. He was insulting her, and she moved her little eyes about in alarm, flung up her hands and whispered in horror, What are you saying, my dear? Good gracious, the coachman will hear. Be quiet or the coachman will hear. He can, hear, he can overhear everything. I don't love you. I don't love you, he went on breathlessly. You've no soul and no morals. Don't dare to wear that raincoat. Do you hear? Or else I'll tear it into rags. Control yourself, my child, my man wept. The coachman can hear. And where is my father's fortune? Where is your money? You've wasted it all. I'm not ashamed of being poor, but I am ashamed of having such a mother. When my schoolfellows ask questions about you, I always blush. In the train, they had to pass two stations before they reached the town. Volodya spent all of the time on the little platform between the two carriages and shivered all over. He did not want to go into the compartment, because there the mother he hated was sitting. He hated himself, hated the ticket collectors, the smoke from the engine, the cold to which he attributed his shivering. And the heavier the weight on his heart, the more strongly he felt that somewhere in the world, among some people, there was a pure, honourable, warm, refined life full of love, affection, gaiety and serenity. He's mentioned this three times now. Three times. It's... He feels... He feels like he's missing out on something in life. And that hurts him. He felt this and was so intensely miserable that one of the passengers, after looking in his face attentively, actually asked, You have the toothache, I suppose. In the town, Maman and Volodya lived with Maria Petrovna, a lady of noble rank, who had a large flat and let rooms to boarders. Maman had two rooms, one with windows and two pictures and gold frames hanging on the walls, in which her bed stood and in which she lived, and a little dark room open and out of it in which Volodya lived. Here there was a sofa on which she slept, and except that sofa there was no other furniture. The rest of the room was entirely filled up with wicker baskets full of clothes, cardboard hat boxes, and all sorts of rubbish, which Maman preserved for some reason or other. Volodya prepared his lessons either in his mother's room or in the general room, as the large room in which the boarders assembled at dinner time and in the evening was called. This sounds a lot like, if you know about Chekhov's life, Chekhov was like a saint. He had to live in cramped living conditions with his mom, his father, his brothers, his whole family, and he basically saved them from poverty. He worked and he worked and he saved them and then he made his community better. He was an absolute saint. But obviously in this story he's exercising some demons, some resentment at having to do so. And maybe this story is yeah, highlighting some of the dark feelings that he had and going down a path that Chekhov could have taken if things had gone the dark side, you know. On reaching home, he lay down on his sofa and put the quilt over him to stop his shivering. The cardboard hat boxes, the wicker baskets, and the other rubbish reminded him that he had not a room of his own, that he had no refuge in which he could get away from his mother, from her visitors, and from the voices that were floating up from the general room. The satchel and the books lying about in the corners reminded him of the examination he had missed. For some reason, they came into his mind, quite inappropriately, mentone where he had lived with his father when he was seven years old. He thought of Biarritz and two little English girls with whom he ran about on the sand. He tried to recall to his memory the colour of the sky, the sea, the height of the waves, and his mood at the time, but he could not succeed. The English girls flitted before his imagination as though they were living. All the rest was a medley of images that floated away in confusion. Ah, <sighs> So, Chekhov's dealing with shame, He's dealing with familial relations, the loss of a father, the, lot, the bad relationship with a mother, first love, being scorned, being rejected, embarrassment, throwing your life away, and memory, the pain of memory, the, the pain that in that little, that little childhood memory of little Edenic bliss that you once had that you can barely access is proof that there is something better, but not for you. Wow. No. It's cold here, thought Volodya. He got up and put on his overcoat and he went into the general room. There they were drinking tea. There were three people at the samovar. 
a man, an old lady with tortoise-shell pince-nez, who gave her music lessons, and Augustine Mihalic, an elderly and very stout French man, who was employed at a perfumery factory. I've had no dinner today, said my man. I ought to send the maid to buy some bread. Donyasha, shouted the Frenchman. It appeared that the maid had been sent out somewhere by the lady of the house. Oh, that's of no consequence, said the Frenchman, with a broad smile. I'll go for some bread myself at once. Oh, it's nothing. He laid his strong, pungent cigar in a conspicuous place, put on his hat and went out. After he had gone away, my man began telling the music teacher how she had been staying at the Chumians, and how warmly they welcomed her. Lily Chumian is a relation of mine, you know, she said. Her late husband, General Chumian, was a cousin of my husband, and she was a baroness Kolb by birth. My man, that's false, said Volodya, irritably. Why tell lies? He knew perfectly well that what his mother said was true. In what she was saying about the General Chumian and about, the, about Baroness Kolb, there was not a word of lying. But nevertheless, he felt that she was lying. There was a suggestion of falsehood in her manner of speaking, in the expression of her face, in her eyes, in everything. Wow, that's the thing. And, and I've come across this where people have said stuff that's factually true, but they're lying. And they're lying as in, they might say something's true, but they're lying because they're basically saying, well, I'm important. You know? Or this means I'm, I'm someone to be admired. Or in why you're saying something. It's always going to frame you in a position. Or you can tell somebody's motivations by why they're saying something. And their, mo their true motivations might be different from what it seems like on the surface. So somebody can seem very false even when what they're saying is true. And similarly, someone can tell an untruth, something that's factually untrue, but say nothing but nothing but truth. That's what that's what poetry is. That's what this short story is. This is fictional, but it's true. It's so true. False information, true sentiment. You are lying, repeated Volodya, and he brought his fist down on the table with such force that all the crockery shook and the man's tea was spilt over. Why do you talk about generals and baronesses? It's all lies. The music teacher was disconcerted and coughed into her handkerchief, affecting to sneeze, and the man began to cry. Where can I go? thought the lodger. He had been in the street already. He was ashamed to go to his schoolfellows. Again, quite incongruously, he remembered the two little English girls. He paced up and down the general room, and went into Augustine Mihalic's room. Here there was a strong smell of ethereal oils and glycerin soap. On the table, in the window, and even on the chairs, there were a number of bottles, glasses and wine glasses containing fluids of various colours. Volodya took up from the table a newspaper, opened it and read the title Figaro. There was a strong and pleasant scent about the paper. Then he took a revolver from the table. There, there, don't take any notice of it. The music teacher was comforting my man in the next room. He is young. Young people of his age never restrain themselves. One must resign oneself to that. No, Yevgenia Drevna, he's too spoiled said Maman in a sing-song voice. He has no one in authority over him, and I am weak and can do nothing. Oh, I am unhappy. Volodya put the muzzle of the revolver to his mouth, felt something like a trigger or spring, and pressed it with his finger. Then felt something else projecting, and once more pressed it. Taking the muzzle out of his mouth, he wiped it with the lapel of his coat, looked at the lock. He had never in his life taken a weapon in his hand before. I believe one ought to raise this, he reflected. Yes. It seems so. Augustin Mihalic went into the general room and with a laugh began telling them about something. Volodya put the muzzle in his mouth again, pressed it with his teeth and pressed something with his fingers. There was the sound of a shot. Something hit Volodya in the back of his head with a terrible violence and he fell on the table with his face downwards among the bottles and the glasses. Then he saw his father, as in mentone, in a top hat with a wide black band on it wearing mourning for some lady, suddenly seize him by both hands, and they fell headlong into a very deep, dark pit. Then everything was blurred and vanished. Wow. <sighs> Wonderful story. And he's seeing his father in mourning, and makes you wonder, is he mourning for himself? Is he mourning for these two English girls? Were these two English girls his? Did they die? Did he then take his life? Is he mourning for the mother? He left a great fortune and is she squandering it because she's celebrating his, his, he's gone or is she upset that he's gone? Is he mourning the sun? Is he watching from beyond and seeing which way the sun's going? History sort of 
somewhat repeating himself. Maybe he was scorned in love too. So many open-ended questions. And such a poignant, poignant end to a great story. Muzzle in the mouth. That's Volodya by Anton Chekhov. Um, if you want to see me do that with another story, please let me know. Thanks for reading along with me.